Good morning. My lecture today continues to discuss the failure of the Maoist model, focusing on the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. In 1958, the second five-year economic development plan started and was called Great Leap Forward. Building on the achievements of the first five-year plan and reflecting Mao's idea that agriculture and industry both had to grow to allow the other to grow, it envisioned a leapfrogging development of both agriculture and industry, as shown uh, in the propaganda poster of the time. In agriculture, communes were uh, created for collective uh, farming. In industry, balanced development of uh, industries of all different sizes and uh, industries in different regions was aimed, which was known as uh, working on two legs. Commune building was the last stage of collectivization. Uh, as uh, we have seen, uh, first there was the creation of mutual aid uh, uh, groups that were composed of five to ten households. And then these uh, mutual aid groups were merged into uh, cooperatives, which consisted of um, 20 to 40 households. Uh, mostly the cooperatives uh, were uh, village-based. Now, communes were created. The size uh, varied uh, uh, widely, but a commune typically uh, had uh, 5,000 uh, households. So um, these communes were created by merging the earlier village-level cooperatives. Now the collective farming was extended to the county level. The largest communes uh, had uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, members. By the end of uh, 1958, 700 million uh, were placed into nearly 30,000 uh, communes. All means of production, lands, tools, animals, etc., were collectively owned. Uh, private ownership was completely abolished. So the peasants forfeited uh, their own lands in uh, less than uh, 10 years after receiving them through uh, land reforms. And uh, the communes uh, private, uh, provided all the services, uh, schools, nursery, nurseries, elderly cares were provided by the communes so that uh, as many adults uh, could focus on uh, working. And uh, individual lives were virtually gone as a result. The commune controlled, managed, or services all aspects of uh, life, even entertainments, were provided by the com communes. Uh, a commune was uh, composed of uh, brigades, which uh, were in turn uh, composed of uh, 12 teams. And each team was composed of uh, 12 families. So, each brigade was made of 144 households. And each team or each brigade was given specific uh, tasks. Uh, everybody involved in communes was urged not only to meet uh, the set targets, uh, the quotas, but to surpass them, but to defeat uh, these set uh, targets. If the communes lacked machinery, the workers used their bare hands uh, 
as uh, you will see uh, in the uh, film. Uh, major constructions were built in record time, though uh, the quality of some of them uh, was quite uh, dubious. Party members oversaw the, the work of a commune to ensure that the decisions uh, followed the party line uh, correctly. And uh, propaganda was everywhere, including in the fields where the workers listened to political speeches uh, while they worked. Uh, in industry, basically, um, a balanced development was aimed. Uh, the communist leadership was interested in a balanced development. And uh, uh, it was dissatisfied with the concentration of industrial plants in coastal areas and in Manchuria. Uh, the first five-year plan included a policy of appropriately locating new industries in different parts of the country uh, so that industrial production will be close to the sources of new materials and the fuels as well as uh, consumer markets. While the large scale uh, modern sector remained in, concentrated in the old economic coastal centers, small and medium uh, industry was promoted in the regions and inland cities. And uh, industrial development uh, originally was to be assisted by the Soviet uh, Union. Uh, Soviet uh, Union had agreed to provide, in the course of uh, uh, the three five-year uh, uh, plans, about the 300 uh, modern industrial plants of all kinds and uh, to train the Chinese to run them. But uh, in 1960, the Soviet technicians were withdrawn uh, from China. Um, uh, at that time, uh, there were about 150 um, uh, plans uh, that, uh, had been constructed, but uh, without the Russian uh, technical assistance, China lacked uh, expertise and experience to run the finished uh, plans. So uh, in the end, in this, uh, after the uh, Russian withdrawal, uh, industrial development had to rely on the so-called backyard furnaces. In the first year of uh, Great Leap Forward, production of steel, coal, chemicals, timber, cement, etc., all showed uh, huge rises. Grain and cotton production also showed major uh, increases. Mao had introduced uh, the Great Leap Forward with the catchphrase, it is possible to accomplish any task whatsoever. Well, at least seen uh, from the vintage point of uh, the end of 1958, uh, this uh, claim of Mao's uh, seemed uh, coming true. So the propaganda uh, poster of the time says, in 15 years, China will surely surpass England. By the end of 1958, a day dream, that vision seemed to come true. However, in 1959, things started to go wrong. Political decisions and beliefs took precedence over common sense and uh, communes faced the task of doing things uh, which they were incapable of uh, achieving. But party officials ordered the impossible and commune leaders who knew what their community, uh, commune was capable of or was not capable of could not complain in fear of being uh, labeled uh, a bourgeois reactionary uh, because such a charge uh, would lead to a prison term. And uh, crudely uh, produced farm machinery, 
fell to pieces when used. Uh, and many thousands of workers were injured while working long hours and falling asleep uh, at their jobs. So they had to work uh, of fields, they had to work the furnaces. Uh, but still uh, produced by the backyard furnaces were, uh, was too impure to be of any use and could not be used in construction, for example. Um, buildings constructed uh, uh, by this substandard steel did not uh, last long. The original idea was to melt uh, down scrap metal to make useful items such as tools and utensils. But what really happened was this. The program worked backwards uh, with the peasants melting down useful items to produce unusable masses of metal. Such destruction of useful objects to increase the production from the backyard blessed furnaces happened simply because quotas of production uh, from the furnaces set by the uh, leaders or uh, uh, party members or the higher authorities had to be met. So when uh, the peasants ran out of scrap metal, they started melting down anything they could find, including useful tools and utensils. Faced uh, with uh, possible per personal punishment, uh, for not uh, meeting the quota or destruction of useful items of a metal, uh, local communist um, uh, leaders chose to try to meet the uh, quota. Uh, they didn't care whether useful items of metal uh, were uh, destroyed or not. But the mixture of metals and the impurities uh, in the fuel produced a metal that could not be formed into anything uh, useful. The metal was too brittle. The backyard uh, blast furnaces and other non-agricultural projects of the Great Leap Forward uh, took labor away from food production and uh, that led to a short fall in food. Uh, China was, as always uh, in uh, recent history, uh, was on the edge of subsistence. So uh, the margin between subsistence and starvation was very narrow. Any decrease in food production means uh, uh, privation, if not uh, starvation. In addition to the decline in food, uh, to the decline in food production, due to the diversion of effort away from agriculture, there were were losses in food production because of the erroneous uh, policies promoted by the state. Uh, one of such idiocies was a close planting. I do not know how many of you are familiar with a planting, but let me tell you why close planting is dangerous. If two plants are set too close to each other, there is not uh, enough nutrients in the soil to feed uh, uh, both. Uh, and both fail. Uh, the state promoted the close planting of grain to increase productivity. Uh, the initial growth of a plant derives from the nutrients uh, stored in the seed itself. Uh, with the close planting, the initial germination produces spectacular results. But when the growth of the plant has to depend upon nutrients drawn from the soil, uh, the close planting uh, produces uh, failures. 
during the Great Leap Forward, uh, there developed a competition for uh, creating the most uh, striking demonstrations of uh, close uh, uh, planting. China's propaganda boasted of uh, miraculous agricultural yields. Uh, close planting of wheat reputedly produced a crop so dense that uh, children could stand on top of it. Uh, this uh, picture from China Pictorial was, like so many others, uh, a fake. The children actually were standing on a bench hidden beneath the, the grain. Uh, this is uh, well explained in a book titled Hungary Ghost uh, that deal with the uh, Great Famine, uh, which followed the Great Leap Forward. To make matters worse, the centralized control resulted in no one with the authority to change things uh, being informed of the decline in food production. The commune leaders were under pressure to exceed the past production. When uh, uh, production declined, they did not report it, or they even reported the uh, uh, increased production. They reported what the higher authorities wanted to hear. This was a uh, uh, problem inherent uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the system. So the policy errors that were leading to food uh, shortfalls went on beyond the point when anyone could do anything about them. The central government made things even worse for the peasant by taking a share based upon the falsified production figures and leaving the peasant too little to survive on. Of course, some try to communicate to Mao Zedong the failures of the Great Leap Forward, but uh, they were denounced as uh, traitors. Uh, Marshal Peng De Hui, Peng De Hui was one of them. Uh, he was a national hero. He had commanded the Chinese troops in the Korean War, and uh, he was denounced and branded as a counter-revolutionary by Mao because he tried to warn against uh, Ma Mao Zedong. Uh, Peng De Hui uh, captured the situation well in his uh, point. The millet is just scattered over the ground. The leaves of the sweet potato are withered. The young and old have gone to smelt iron. To harvest the grain, there are only children and old women. How shall we get through the next year? I shall agitate and speak out on behalf of the people. And uh, he tried that and he was denounced. Famine uh, naturally followed. And uh, famine was particularly severe in some areas. Uh, even in areas like uh, Sichuan province, which was a, um, a grain basket, rice basket for the whole China. The people in these areas were forbidden to leave their uh, area and so were doomed to starvation. Altogether, about 45 million people died in this great famine. The famine was caused by the shortfall in food production, but this was a result of bad policies and centralization of power in the central government. And it was made worse by the refusal to admit the problem. During the time peasants were starving in countryside, 
uh, while the government was shipping grain to Soviet uh, Union to pay uh, for its uh, loans. Uh, some grain also rotted in uh, warehouses located in the cities. This famine was kept secret from the outside world until China began uh, opening up to the outside world and uh, demographers began analyzing the population uh, statistics. When Mao finally accepted the fact that the, um, the Great Leap Forward had failed, he left the task of achieving an economic recovery to Liu Xiaoqi, uh, Deng Xiaoping, and Zhou Enlai. The three uh, did bring about the recovery, but in 1966, Mao sought to return to absolute power uh, again. Uh, the power struggle took the form of the great proletarian cultural revolution, uh, which he continued until Mao's death in 1976. It was a uh, social and uh, economic disaster uh, for China, but uh, it was a brilliant uh, guerrilla warfare on the part of uh, Mao. Mao may have been a uh, uh, full uh, in the matters of uh, economic policy, but he was a genius in guerrilla uh, work. So um, uh, if you are interested uh, in uh, Great Leap Forward and uh, uh, Great uh, the Famine uh, that uh, followed it, uh, you are recommended to read these two books. Uh, one is Hungary uh, Ghost, and the other is Mao's Great Famine. Oh, there is a saying uh, in uh, China, one sight is better than uh, 100 words, or 100 words are not as good as one sight, uh, depending on how you translate. But anyway, to help you understand what the Great Leap Forward was like, I selected two uh, of the video footages available uh, on the YouTube. If you have time, I strongly recommend you uh, to watch uh, some more uh, on the uh, YouTube. In 1958, Mao launched his most ambitious campaign to date, the Great Leap Forward. His goal was to make China the industrial equal of Western nations in just 15 years. His method was to mobilize the entire country to work day and night by promising a better future. Mao's word was so powerful that almost overnight, people's communes sprang up across China. A commune encompassed many villages with thousands of families. Each day was strictly regimented and family life was virtually abolished. Children were placed in communal nurseries while their parents worked around the clock. People ate in the fields or in communal dining halls. To increase industrial output, communes were ordered to make steel. People collected walks, pots, bed frames, and tools, anything made of iron or steel. They built small furnaces to melt them. The biggest challenge was to keep the furnaces fueled. At night, you could see many furnaces along the railroad. Fire shot out of the furnaces. But the steel people made was useless. People were unhappy, but nobody dared say anything. The result was that everything made of iron and steel was taken from every family and was made useless. While the government called on everyone to make steel, they also wanted to increase farm output. 
How could we increase the grain harvest? People said that if you did close planting and used more fertilizer, you would definitely increase output. During the Great Leap Forward, we believed miracles could happen. There was a saying, the corn will grow higher the more you desire. Communes and schools reported their wonderful news to the party. If one commune said they could turn out 150 tons an acre, another one would say their target was 180 tons. Each commune or school would promise a higher amount until the last school gave their highest figure. Our school set the target of 470 tons an acre. We dug a hole, something like a swimming pool. We thought if we put all the fertilizer in it, we would achieve our target. Then we poured the seeds in, which build up into a layer about this thick. There was a photograph in the People's Daily that showed the wheat in a field supporting the weight of children. Some leaders of the Central Party Committee were so happy that they put this photo on their desks at work. Most people believed it. We were surprised to see that photo and wondered how it could be possible. But because we were city people, we couldn't be sure it was a fake. After the anti-rightist campaign, few dared to ask questions. Later, I learned it was all fake. The peasants were putting on a show for us. They moved grain from other places and put it all in one field. It was all a show for Mao. Under pressure to produce more, to launch satellites to heaven, as it was called, party officials inflated production figures. An ominous cycle began as the state took more and more grain based on false figures, leaving the peasants with nothing to eat. By the summer of 1959, the leaders knew the Great Leap Forward was going badly wrong. After his trip, Mao decided to moderate production targets. In July 1959, the party met at the mountain resort of Lushan to set new, realistic goals. Minister of Defense Peng Dehuai, the hero of the Korean War, was one of Mao's oldest revolutionary comrades. Peng wrote to Mao describing what he saw as the problems of the Great Leap Forward. What Peng intended as loyal criticism, Mao saw as political treachery. Zhou Enlai and Liu Shaoqi agreed with Peng, but even they did not dare speak out. As a result, production goals were not cut. Officials continued to demand more grain than the peasants could give. The Great Leap Forward continued through 1960. Millions of peasants were starving. The famine was very severe and widespread, but newspapers did not report it at all. People only knew that their local area was suffering. To keep the news from spreading, peasants were not allowed to leave their areas, even to beg. The famine lasted three years. An estimated 30 million people died. Mao's revolution, fought to give the Chinese people a better life, had helped create the largest famine in history. But the boldest attempt to harness the energy and enthusiasm of the people came in 1958. To speed up progress, Mao wanted to use the force he believed in most, China's sheer numbers, for his great leap forward. Propaganda cartoons showed how the Chinese were meant to overtake Western industry and food production. Peasants, already reorganized into cooperatives, were herded into huge communes. In his area, District Secretary Zhong Guodong took on another challenge. <laughs> I was responsible for setting up people's communes and turned eight agricultural cooperatives into two big communes. 
There were over 100,000 people in each one. Big communes could handle big projects. With thousands of people to do a job, things were completed in no time. Production brigades were directed to where they were thought to be needed most, under militia-like discipline. The party said it was a more efficient, better, faster way to build socialism. Private land had already gone. Now family life was to be destroyed as well. Peasants were to eat food cooked in central kitchens. Children would be looked after together. Mao set the target of doubling food production in one year. Revolutionary enthusiasm, he said, will triumph over all obstacles. He took a close interest as the peasants competed to increase yields. When the Dongshun commune promised a record harvest, it was Zhong Guo Dong, the district secretary, who showed the chairman round. Chairman Mao himself visited the show field and asked how much it was expected to yield. My colleague said 50,000 pounds an acre. Chairman Mao replied to him, even if you could achieve 10% of that, it would be a miracle. The party encouraged the rivalry. In the past, wheat yields had been 500 pounds an acre. Huishang 三分措施加了马,我们措施再火箭 In fact, the records were bogus. Communes falsified their figures. 就把那个生产的好道子 we removed all the ready planted rice from the fields and replanted it in a show field so that we could reach our quota. Planting it so densely with no light or wind blowing through meant it would rot. Before long the rice did rot and the peasants got angry. They said, if you take all the rice and waste it, what will we eat in the autumn? The peasants didn't want to go on with this cheating. I tried to get it stopped, but the municipal boss ordered us to carry on. But the full statistics contributed to a dangerous delusion that China had plenty of food and could concentrate on other things. We must reach for the moon and the stars, said Mao. Man can achieve anything he can imagine. Great construction projects also pulled mass numbers against apparently insuperable obstacles. Lin County in Henan was an arid plain blocked off by mountains. The 3,000 kilometers long Red Flag Canal was planned to bring in water over the rocky terrain. The canal workers were celebrated as revolutionary heroes.
Jin Yang Chung worked on the rock face. I'd tie a rope around my body and swing out in the air. I used a pick to remove the loose stones. When they fell, I had to try hard to keep out of the way and avoid getting my legs broken. Accidents were frequent. Shen Yang Chung was sent to clear up afterwards. When you were at the foot of the mountain and looked up, you could see bits of flesh glinting in the sun. I climbed down the rope. I picked up some dirt to wipe away every trace of the bodies. Otherwise people would have been too frightened to carry on. But the canal took twice as many people and far longer to build than expected. Initially, there were 30,000 on the project. The plan was that if each person built one meter, the canal would be completed in one or two months. But it was all much more difficult, because the canal was halfway up a mountain. In the end, it took ten years to complete. Great Leap Forward's most ambitious goal, Chinese were told production of steel also had to double in one year. And instead of producing this just from heavy industry, the energy and goodwill of the peasants was to be mobilized again. Small furnaces were built in villages and backyards across the country. They collected any scrap they could find. Next, they melted down doorknobs, wash basins, tools. As the fever grew, people even gave up their cooking walks. He Xinhua had never made steel before, but used her ingenuity. When we built our own furnaces, it was hard to reinforce them. Earth on its own wasn't strong, but we didn't have enough straw. I had a long pigtail, so I cut it off and snipped it into short pieces and mixed it with the earth in the furnace wall. Many of the other women cut off their hair as well. He Qinghua's husband, Yen Qian Yun, also found at the time, was just as keen. The two of us competed really hard. If my team produced three tons of steel a ship, her team would make over three tons. And then I would encourage my team to think of ways to beat that. Forests were decimated to fuel the furnaces 24 hours a day. All over China, almost everyone, even hospital doctors, neglected their normal jobs to answer the call. But even those taking part, began to see it was folly. All we did was make steel and nothing else. We didn't produce anything useful. How could we? We dug holes in the ground and tried to produce steel. It was all such a waste of time. But the orders came from above. We had to obey them. Slowly it became clear that after so much effort and time, after so much wood had been burnt and so many pots consigned to the flames, the steel produced was impure, weak and useless. The 
full effect of the disastrous experiment began to be seen in 1959. While the peasants had been making steel, they had done little else. Crops had rotted in the fields. Seed hadn't been planted. Food was already short. Because of the falsely exaggerated harvest, the government had taken a bigger share of the crops to send to the cities. A drought made the problem worse. In 1960, the scarcity turned into a major famine. National food production fell over a quarter. Local secretary Luo Shifa had been away from his village studying at a party school. When I came back from Beijing, I saw that many people had bloated stomachs from starvation. We had 1,600 starving people in our commune. Some were falling over with weakness and just lying in the road. Others died. When the peasants saw me, they began to cry. I cried too. They said to me, if I got there any later, they might all have been dead. In a secret report, the party later admitted the full extent of the calamity. Their own figures showed that over 20 million had died from the famine. It was almost certainly more. The new graves in the burial grounds confirmed that the Great Leap had failed. Revolutionary enthusiasm hadn't been enough. By the end of 1959, it was obvious that the Great Leap Forward had been a failure and even Mao admitted this. He called on the Communist Party to take him to task over his failure, but also asked his own party members to look at themselves and their performance. Some party members put the blame uh, on the failure of the Great Leap Forward on Mao. He was popular with the people, but he still had to resign from his position as head of state, though he remained uh, in the powerful uh, party uh, chairman uh, position. The day-to-day -day running of China was left to two, three uh, moderates, Liu Xiaoqi, Zhou Enlai, and Deng Xiaoping. In late 1960, they abandoned the Great Leap Forward. They adopted a new strategy of economic development and new series of economic uh, policies. The new policies, known as a new economic uh, policy, featured uh, the greater scope given for market forces and free price movements, the shift to uh, profitability as a motive force in both agricultural and industrial production, and the increased authority of managers, planners, and technical personnel. And the uh, economy began to recover. Output, which had declined in 1960 and 61, had certainly recovered by 1963, and the economy was moving uh, ahead. Uh, investment, renewed after 1961, also played its part and probably reached 20% of national output by 1962. The result was increased industrial production. Uh, one official estimate is that the industrial production rose by 15%. Uh, the three moderates um, had restricted Mao's power, but uh, his standing among the ordinary Chinese people was still high, as he was seen as the leader of the Red Revolution.
And uh, Mao was to use this popularity with the people to resurrect his authority at the expense of the moderates. Uh, he criticized that uh, revolution uh, was being reversed uh, by bourgeois elements. And uh, he cried out for the need to advance the revolution to an even higher level. Uh, this was uh, the so-called uh, cultural revolution. Mao once again committed the nation uh, to his uh, socialist vision. The great proletarian cultural revolution of 1966 to 1976 was an indirect tra tradition of uh, Mao's conception of revolution as a continuing uh, process. He said, the existing situation must be constantly reviewed and called into question to prevent the re-emergence of the former exploiting classes in positions of influence in the form of repeated class struggle movements and a whole series of policies of thought reform and rectification uh, movements. Seen from this perspective, any deviation from his earlier policies, like a new economic policy, was a dangerous deviation or backtracking of the revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there were uh, many uh, precursors to cultural revolution. Whenever uh, Mao deemed that uh, revolution uh, as a backtracking, uh, he uh, started uh, rectification uh, movements to keep the revolution uh, moving uh, forward. Uh, in the early 1970s, there was a rectification campaign among party cadres. Uh, in the 1950, there was a thought reform campaign among the intellectuals. And um, uh, there was in 1951, three anti's uh, campaign among the party cadres against uh, corruption, waste, and bureaucracy. Uh, in 1952, there was a five anti's campaign directed against the bribery, tax evasion, fraud, theft of government property, and theft of state economic secrets by merchants and industrials. And uh, in 1957, new rectification campaign uh, was uh, directed against the bureaucratic tendencies among party cadres and the state um, officials. So, um, as I said, the great proletarian cultural revolution was an indirect tradition of uh, uh, Mao's uh, campaigning uh, against the revolution, ossifying and uh, uh, creating a new um, a ruling uh, elites. So, as um, Mao started the uh, Cultural Revolution, China once again fell into chaos and socialist uh, excesses until Mao's death in 1976 stopped it. To grasp what it was like, uh, as I said, one film, one sight, uh, would be much better than the 100 uh, slides or words. I selected um, uh, one for you, but I, I recommend you uh, watch some more of our video uh, footages abundantly available on the YouTube. Thank you for your attention. In the aftermath, Mao kept to the side and let the president Liu Shaoqi run the country. Even Mao knew that the economy had to be protected from his revolutionary zeal for the time being. 
so more cautious targets were set. Large communes were abandoned. Chinese peasants were allowed some land again and could sell their produce in free markets. They were allowed to live as families and return to something near normal life. There were fewer slogans. But Mao was biding his time. He worried his revolution was going off the boil. He saw a privileged bureaucratic class emerging, as had happened in the Soviet Union. He feared the return of capitalism and materialist incentives. He believed China's chance to have a perfect socialist society was passing. Mao's supporters printed a book of quotations from his political speeches and writing and used them as the basis for a new attack on what was called the capitalist road. We still have to wage a protracted struggle against bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideology, said Mao. As he tried to regain power, Mao used a piece of spectacular political showmanship to revive his reputation. <laughs> To demonstrate his continuing vigor, at the age of 72, he led a mass swim across the river Yangtze. Trying to break the thinking and attitudes of old China, he began with her traditional culture. The thousand-year-old Beijing opera was singled out as the start of his attack. If it could be changed, then anything could be. Eight new revolutionary plays were written to replace all the old stories of emperors and concubines. Tung Xiangling, who once played princes, now took the lead as an officer in the People's Army. <laughs> I was chosen to play this revolutionary role, and it was a great honor. As artists, we were engineers of human souls. We didn't just perform to earn money, but had a serious responsibility to re-educate people. We were so happy that Chairman Mao was creatively involved in this opera. In 1966, the great proletarian cultural revolution was well underway. The group behind it, led by Mao's wife, and later to be called the Gang of Four, tried to build the Mao cult to new heights. In school, children recited his message to them. In Shanghai, at the number six girls' school, Xiao Ailing was the headmistress. The pupils came to realize that all the changes taking place in their families, at school, in Shanghai and China, were brought about by Chairman Mao. Students were used to carry the cultural revolution forward. For the first time, young people were encouraged to attack authority and the old hierarchy of the party. And the advice came from Mao himself. 
bombard the headquarters, he said. To rebel is justified. One of the Beijing students who were the first to call themselves Red Guards was Zhang Baoqing. Chairman Mao started the cultural revolution to keep up the momentum for change. Everything he said was right. We thought if we follow Mao, we can't go wrong. Only he can lead us from one victory to another. A succession of huge rallies were held in Tiananmen Square. The master of mass mobilization had shown he could still draw a political response directly from the people. This time it wasn't the peasants in the country who did his bidding. The most educated and energetic generation in China were following his every word. The students felt excited and liberated as never before. An estimated 11 million Red Guards came to see Mao. 15-year-old Zhao Shoujun was presented to him. I was so overwhelmed by the excitement, my mind just went blank. The only thing I wanted to do was to get a good look at Chairman Mao and shake his hand if I got the chance. I shook hands with him three times. Because I'd been received by Chairman Mao, millions of Red Guards regarded me with awe. When they saw me, they always wanted to shake the hand that Chairman Mao had shaken. The rising fervor was directed at Mao's rivals, including President Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. Banners attacked Liu. Even small children were taught to denounce Liu. The rage was extended to foreign governments with attacks on Western diplomats in Beijing. Anyone who was in power of any kind was denounced as a capitalist roader. The whole structure of the party was brought down, including Zhong Guodong, the district secretary in Qianqin. In all the previous campaigns, I'd been singling people out and telling them their mistakes. I was the one who found fault with them. I didn't expect the tables to be turned on me this time round. Some of the biggest high school students who were very loyal to Chairman Mao pressed my head down, twisted both my hands behind my back and made me bend over throughout the denunciation meeting. I didn't think I'd survive. In Sichuan, Luo Shifa, the party secretary who'd helped his village through the famine, was denounced. In 
I didn't expect the Cultural Revolution would affect me. Why should it? I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. And always had the support of the people. At the denunciation meeting, they slapped my face and forced me to kneel down. Kneeling on hot charcoal and broken glass was almost a daily routine. So what I did was to put a soft pad inside my trousers, and that made it easier when I was forced to my knees. In schools, pupils attack their teachers. So it's just such a good school. Our headmaster had been really good to us, but even he couldn't escape. We didn't hate him personally, but he represented bourgeois values, so we had to attack him. We dragged our headmaster onto the school stage, then students put a dunce's cap on his head and a big placard around his neck. The more extreme we were, the more loyal we felt to Chairman Mao. In Shanghai, the teacher who had taught her class to love Mao was now accused of being disloyal. There were several hundred red guards wearing armbands. Others had military belts. Some had scissors in their hands ready to cut people's hair. They chopped off my hair and beat me with sticks. They ordered me to produce the Red Book and to recite that revolution means rebellion and violence. That day I was wearing a white shirt without pockets, so I wasn't carrying the Red Book with me. They said, if you're not carrying the Red Book, that means you aren't loyal to Chairman Mao. How dare you say you love Chairman Mao? You deserve to be overthrown. It was December in Shanghai and very cold. They ordered me to stand outside in the playground from morning till night. But then they thought the punishment wasn't severe enough. So they got a big blackboard and pressed it down on me. One of them stood on the right side and one on the left like a seesaw. And I was squashed in the middle. They wanted to knock me down and keep me down forever. Xiao Ailing was left with permanent injuries to her face. Up to a million were killed or driven to suicide. The country was now in the grip of a revolutionary mania that became more and more violent and destructive. The Red Guards attacked the four olds. Old habits, old ideas, old customs, old culture. Books were burnt and museums pillaged. Soon, rival factions of Red Guards fought one another. We used clubs and guns. Many were beaten until they bled, others died. But we all felt we were the true defenders of Chairman Mao's revolution. To die for the great leader was an honor. The anarchy spread. Schools and hospitals closed. Offices and factories were in chaos. The factory almost came to a standstill. Production was impossible. We had meetings every day and workers were denounced. We didn't know what to do. One day you'd be arrested and the next day it would be my turn. We didn't know what would happen to the country. Many workers committed suicide by jumping in front of trains or into the river. 
the attempt at a state of continuous revolution was impossible to keep up. People craved the return of a more normal, stable life. After two years, the army had to be called in to end the factional fighting, restore order, and help to re-establish the party's authority. And the Red Guards were sent to the countryside to cool off and learn from the peasants. But the Cultural Revolution only ended with Mao himself in 1976. Shai 1976-9 In a bid to keep the country together, the propagandists exploited the scenes of mass emotion on Mao's death. Much of the grief was genuine and many had seen their lives improve beyond measure. But many millions had suffered or died as victims of Mao's rhetoric. All his charisma hadn't delivered the new society he'd promised. <laughs> <laughs> 